So hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar today that's titled Growth Driven Website Design for Your Nonprofits. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here at TechSoup. And I want to ask you a big favor. If this is your first time joining us, um, you probably know you're on mute. But for those of you who have been here for a while, some people already turned on the closed caption. I'm going to show you in the next slide how you can engage. Um, we would love for you to ask as many questions as you like. We can be here all day, just kidding. John and Melissa are like, what? But put your questions in the Q&A and you can also put them in the chat as well. We're gonna email you the slides and the video replay by tomorrow. And if you need the closed caption, like I said, someone has already turned it on, but if you need the closed caption, just look at the bottom of your Zoom screen and just click on the CC button. There's gonna be a two question survey that will pop up if you have to leave early or when you leave at the end of this webinar. We would love for you to tell us what you'd like to hear more from TAP Network. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to the team from TAP Network. We have John Hill and Melissa Pitts here and Jason from the background. You guys have a great webinar. Thanks. Awesome, thanks, Rita. So I'll first have the agenda here. So quickly just to run over this, we're gonna have the introduction to who we are, and then we're gonna go into that growth-driven design. So we'll talk about the different phases of this. So that'll be the strategy, the launchpad website, and then that continuous improvement. Then we'll have um, the TechSoup website services that we offer for you guys. And then at the end, we will have some Q&A for you guys. So uh, if you wanna hold some questions for there, but we do also have Jason, who will be in the chat to uh, answer some of those if anything pops up while we're going along. Um, Melissa, do you want to introduce yourself? Do you want me to go? Sure, I can go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Pitts. I'm the Director of Client Services at TAP. I work closely with our nonprofit clients to uh, build their websites, but also on marketing strategy and technology as well. And I am John Hill. I'm a web project manager here at TAP. I work with all the different teams here from the designers to the devs to the account managers. Uh, I work throughout all the website projects to make sure they uh, flow from beginning to end with ease. And we, as Aretha mentioned, we do also have Jason Spangler, our Director of Business Development, in the chat to answer any questions as they come up and any um, to share with the group we will get to at the end. Quick introduction to TAP Network. We are TechSoup's provider for website and digital marketing services. We're going to be talking a lot about our work with websites, obviously, today. Um, we work, as I mentioned, primarily with nonprofits. So our full account team and all of our resources that work on our projects as well have a great understanding of what makes nonprofits tick. So we really hope that we can speak your language and we really uh, feel like our work it can help you support your mission and reach your goals as a nonprofit organization. These are a few of our services. The majority of the work that we do is custom, um, but this can just give you an idea of the work TAPS team does. Uh, it can be divided out into kind of three segments if you look at this, uh, if you look at this slide. So we have our web work, which could be things like website development, e-commerce, SEO, and content marketing. We have our marketing services, which are things like paid media. Uh, strategy, social media marketing, and then we have our MarTech or marketing technology services, which are things like our custom app development, inbound marketing, my uh, integrations and migrations, and HubSpot implementations. All right, so up first we do have a poll question. So if you guys wanna answer this in the chat with either A, B, C, or D, uh, what is the status of your organization's website? A, we do not have a website, but we're looking to create one. B, we have a website that we plan to redesign or redevelop in the next 12 months. C, we're happy with our current website, but it needs some updates. Or D, we're happy with our website as it is. Seeing a lot of bees in the chat. A lot of bees, a couple of C's. And it looks like some D's as well. Those are got a wide range here. Yeah, I don't see a ton of A's. So <laughs> it sounds like we're all working with, for the most part, working with existing sites. Exactly. 
All right, cool. Well, hopefully this uh, webinar will give you guys a better understanding of what uh, we could potentially do with your guys' sites. So let's jump right in and talk about why websites are so critical for nonprofits. Um, it's where you can enhance engagement with your supporters and your community. You can you know, drive donations and attract volunteers. It's also that central hub for education and information for your cause, right? Um, you know, a website is a location that's accessible 24-7 anywhere in the world. So this lets you reach a far wider audience than traditional methods. Um, couple that with website analytics, and you can gain really valuable data and insight into who your supporters are and what interests them. And this will allow you to kind of tailor your outreach and your messaging for a better impact. Um, and of course, accessibility and inclusivity. A well-designed website is going to ensure that everyone can learn about your mission and get involved, regardless of your location or abilities. Um, and that's really kind of just like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, websites are a chance to amplify your voice to make a bigger, uh, like an even bigger difference. So first, let's talk about uh, what makes a great nonprofit website. We want a website that can grow with you, right? So that's where the scalability and flexibility comes in. Your website should be able to handle increased traffic and adapt to your changing needs on both the front and the back end. Uh, you want to think of it as a living document, you know, not a static brochure. Uh, the best nonprofit websites prioritize user experience or UX. This means uh, making it easy for visitors to navigate, find the information they need, and take action. So, you know, imagine somebody coming to your website for the first time. Can they easily understand your mission, where to donate, where uh, volunteer opportunities are within just a few clicks. That's the user experience that we're going to be striving for. Uh, and then finally, also a great nonprofit uh, also leverages the integration opportunities. That means connecting your website with the tools that you already use. Uh, things like donor management software or email marketing platforms. This all can streamline your workflows and create a more cohesive experience for you and your supporters. So by focusing on these three elements, that's you know the scalability, the UX, and the integrations, you can build a website that's really a really powerful asset for your nonprofit. Uh, and now I'll hand it back over to Melissa, who's going to talk a little bit further about what that growth-driven design actually is. Melissa? Thanks, John. So when we're looking to build a great nonprofit website, uh, growth-driven design is the name of the approach or the methodology that we have found works best when working with all, all sorts of organizations and businesses, but specifically for nonprofit organizations. It allows for, like John mentioned, that scalability and flexibility. It also fits well with the structure of most of the organizations that we work with, with their budget. It allows for planning and growth of the organization without having to start from scratch with your website every time there's an update. So when we're looking at the growth-driven methodology uh, versus what we'll call traditional website design, uh, traditional website design is difficult to plan. So what we've seen happen when we don't take a growth-driven approach is an organization, maybe it's a brand new organization, is looking to build their website and they're thinking of all the things they might be in a year, in two years, in five years. And with that website, they're kind of trying to knock it all out at once, right? But it's really, really difficult to know, especially with a newer organization or one that is in the process of a lot of growth. It's hard to know what you might look like in five years and to build a website accordingly. So it's very difficult to plan to have a website that is going to do everything you need it to do ever over the next one, two, and five years. Uh, what that directly leads to is high cost and long timelines, right? So it's going to take a while to talk that through to figure it out, whether that be with the partner that's building your website or just internally trying to figure out a game plan. It's going to be a higher cost because I imagine you'd anticipate needing more features in five years than you do right now. Um, so there, you know, there are multiple and multiple items that lead to a higher cost and longer timeline with a traditional website design. Um, it's also uh, doesn't allow for that many updates following the launch. So uh, 
when we're planning these things out, a lot of times we're trying to get ahead of ourselves and we might be creating content that maybe doesn't apply yet or doesn't exist. And uh, maybe backing ourselves into a corner a little bit where we're stuck with content that we might need to adjust as our organization changes. So um, sites that are designed the traditional way aren't necessarily built to add as we go. And that's something we really want to address with growth, the growth driven methodology. And just a little bit of a visual here to kind of show you um, what that looks like. The traditional route uh, is longer and takes a ton of time. The growth-driven approach kind of is a, a step methodology uh, where we can get something up and running very quickly, but then build on it over time so that in five years, you still have the same website, but it is closer to what your organization actually is at that time. This is what the uh, the various phases of growth-driven design look like. So there are three key phases, and then you can see the third phase is kind of broken down. But the first phase is strategy. We're going to dive further into each of these, so I won't elaborate too much right now. The second is a launch pad website. So this is the first concept of your website that is live for your audience. And then continuous improvement. And you can see that this is cyclical. So this is a key piece of growth-driven design is that we're always iterating on the website. The Launchpad site is up and it's flexible, but we can continue to move through those updates as changes happen within the organization. Uh, maybe, you know, your mission is evolving. Maybe the audiences that you're reaching are changing. And that's where continuous improvement comes in. So phase one, let's dive into that a little bit more. So phase one is going to be strategy. This is key. And we always like to stress that spending time in the strategy phase is only going to benefit the project long term. We want to think through the strategy phase, not in a traditional web design way where I mentioned we want to think of everything that's ever going to happen, but we want to really understand how your organization works right now. We want to do an analysis of your target audience. We want to look at your goals for the site as of right now. We can include long-term goals in that plan, but we don't want to spend too much time getting caught up in those. We also want to do a content audit. And we want to put together a site structure that is going to work for you now, but also has room to grow. So when we talk about ta target audience analysis and persona development, we're going to go a little bit more into persona development uh, further in the presentation when we talk about user experience. But I wanted to include this resource that's here, and you'll have the link when uh, you have the copy of the presentation following the webinar. But Following this persona creator, this really allows you to put to analyze your target audience and put together these semi-fictional representations of your stakeholders and audiences so that everyone within your organization is aligned on who you're trying to reach. So the reason we have this in the strategy phase is that alignment point. Uh, oftentimes what we find is we'll ask a group, uh, maybe it's a board of directors, maybe it's a, a group of stakeholders from an organization, who are you trying to reach? And each of them has a different person that's important to their piece of the work um, or their perspective of the mission. So being able to kind of get this out, agree upon it and write it down helps everyone be on the same page as far as who we're talking to, who the content is for and what content needs to exist. That brings us to our content audit. So this visual here is a tool we use called Airtable, but the general practice behind the content audit is gathering all of the existing content that your organization has. So the most basic example is of your current website. We use a search engine crawling tool, which you can find most of the time uh, for smaller sites. You can find a free tool or a relatively inexpensive tool that will crawl your website and spit back a list of all of the URLs for your website. Um, and then you can also pull out the page titles. And what we ask organizations to do is go through and mark each of these pages, take a look at them, pull them up on your current site and decide what do you want to keep exactly as it is on your new website? 
what do you want to keep the general idea of, but you need to change the pictures or the content, um, something about the page maybe is outdated, uh, that status would be update. And then the best part, my favorite part, is all the stuff that needs to get deleted, right? So things that have been added to your website over time that are no longer needed and aren't relevant to the organization anymore, just pull those right out of the of the list. And then you're working with a list of content for your new site, and you can use that as a checklist for the rest of your planning. Another option would be to pull things if you have brochures, flyers, if you don't have an existing website, any content that your group is, your organization has created in the past, pull that all together, drop it in a spreadsheet and do the same thing. And then site architecture. So once we get through that process, once we get an idea of who are we reaching and what content do we have already, we also want to go through the process of what content needs to exist to reach those target audiences. So don't forget to fill in that gap as well. Once we have that list of all of the pages that need to exist on the new site, you want to take a look at them. You want to see how they can com be combined, how they, uh, you know, does it make sense to have this by itself or can this information go together? Does it serve the same purpose? Really, you know, finalize that audit. And then we want to put together the site architecture. So this is just a rough mock-up of what a site May, a site's main navigation might look like. And I really find that this helps everyone wrap their head around what we're building for the new site. So building out something like this as a visual, another option would be if you have a lot of stakeholders within your organization that, that have different perspectives, that have different opinions, you might wanna do this exercise actually offline or you could do it virtually as well. But an exercise in person would be to write each of the pages that you're gonna have on a note card and go through an exercise where you have each stakeholder arrange the note cards in the way, the way that makes most sense for them as the user. And then, you know, take pictures of them at the end and see what commonalities there were between everyone's lineup of pages and use that to influence your site structure. Cool. Uh, I'll go over phase two. So uh, phase two is all about building your Launchpad website, kind of like Melissa said earlier. Uh, so this is the initial uh, building grounds for your website. The key element here is, uh, of course, the content management system or CMS. Think of this as kind of the engine that powers your website, if you will. Um, you know, a powerful CMS allows us to customize it for your needs during development. But a great website isn't just, of course, about functionality. It's also about creating a positive user experience, uh, that UX. So we work with design professionals who understand the unique needs of nonprofits uh, they'll help create a website that's visually appealing, easy to navigate, and also optimized for you know, mobile devices. And we also understand the importance of integration. You know, it's here we can help uh, set up those initial integrations with the tools you, you already use. Like I said earlier, maybe a donor management tool or email marketing. Um, this will then help streamline your workflow and ensure that all your data is talking to each other. Uh, so with all these pieces designed and dev out, we'll test your site across multiple platforms and devices to make sure that no matter where a user is coming from, they can always reach you. Um, but now we'll kind of dive into some of these things a little bit further. Up first, we'll talk about the content management systems. So think of these as like an operating system on your phone, like let's say iOS for iPhones. Um, it's here. Here you can see kind of a few, few of them. Uh, we don't work in all of these systems, but maybe you've heard of some of the other ones and maybe that can help you understand the area that these fall in. Uh, so on the left, we've got managed CMSs, which you may be um, familiar with. They are taught as a very easy to use experience. Um, that's because they usually have, uh, they're a little more limited, I would say, on what they allow you to do. So these work great for um, an easier, more simple brochure style websites that don't really need much customization or flexibility in things. Uh, and then on the right, we've got open source CMSs. These are going to give you a lot of that freedom when making a website, but often, often will involve a lot of coding up front, um, may require some more advanced knowledge in making those websites function post also. So we normally work uh, in WordPress. This is because it's a powerful CMS that allows us to create the custom content to fit any needs that the site may have, either through custom coding or plugins. Um, WordPress kind of finds that perfect balance of having a structured framework. So once the site is done, you can go in and easily still have to learn, but learn how to make your own updates, um, but still 
allows our dev team to explore and make uh, websites that fit your needs, um, you know, the needs of uh, your site's users. And then that kind of leads me over into UX. Uh, UX, user experience, is about understanding your visitors' needs or and creating a website that is um, intuitive, informative, you know, engaging. Some key UX considerations we focus on when developing and maintaining these websites are things like understanding your audience, which would be creating personas. You know, these are those detailed profiles to understand your ideal website visitors. Uh, this is going to help us understand the goals and the challenges and their online behaviors. Another thing is uh, you know, the user journeys. So when we map out a user journey, uh, that's going to track the steps a user takes to complete specific tasks on your website. And I'll go into more of that shortly. Uh, and then also, you know, mobile first design accessibility for all. So making sure that your website is accessible for everyone. Also integration and automation. So like I talked earlier, kind of making sure we're streamlining all those processes to make uh, the user experience efficient for everyone. Um, so by focusing on all these different types of UX elements, we can help create a website that's not only beautiful, but also effective in achieving your goals. Let's dive a little bit further into a few of these. So first let's talk about the user journeys. So, you know, imagine it's a road a visitor takes on your website from the moment they land, uh, where they'll hopefully become either a donor or a volunteer or whatever you're looking for. Each pin along the road kind of represents a touch point or an interaction they're going to have with your website. And then here's an example of a user journey. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of different paths to reach one goal. Um, so we want to make sure that they're all covered. I'm not going to go through this entire map, but you know, quickly looking at this, um, at more one of the more simple paths, this journey is for somebody applying for a job. But this could easily also follow a very similar path for something like volunteering. Um, if we look at the, at the left, where it starts with awareness, we'll follow the very bottom path. They see a posting on Indeed, and then that link brings the user to the career's landing page, where then our path splits. They can either directly apply and bypass towards the end to the automated email response before the full engagement on your end happens, or if we walk it back a little bit, let's say they end up on the landing page where they fill out uh, their email in a form about what uh, you do, and then that email is added to your CRM. We can see a list on the back end of where that email came from, in this case, the careers landing page, right? Um, and see, and then send some targeted emails tailored to their interests directly to them. These automated engagements will hopefully um, get them to go back to that landing page and then complete the path to apply and then allow you to do the full engagement with them in the end. So like I said, there's a lot of different ways this can work. This is just one quick example. And then up next, we can talk a little bit about uh, mobile opt optimization. Uh, so we're going to you know, make sure that your site is responsive on desktop, tablets, mobile, uh, checking for things like speed, sizing, layouts, engagement, all that kind of stuff. Working with good UX makes mobile optimization a lot easier to begin with. Um, you know, if, if we work with a responsive design in mind, a site can easily scale down from desktop to mobile, as we can see here. You know, the header breaks in sections allowing the text to be easily readable and still looks really nice. You know, we keep this type of optimization in mind when we're designing anything for web, um, which then also leads me into accessibility. Um, so I won't cover each one of these in detail, but um, first we do have the lack of alt text. Uh, images without alternative text can make it really hard for people who rely on screen readers to access content and know what they're looking at on the page. So providing descriptive alt text ensures that all users can understand the purpose and context of those images. And I'll be going over that one a little bit more coming up. Another one is inadequate color contrast. So poor color contrast can make it difficult for people to see or read. Um, you know, people with visual impairments can make looking at your site difficult. Uh, another one is, of course, unclear navigation. Complex or confusing navigation structures can hinder users from finding information easily. Uh, like we already discussed, non-responsive design. You know, we want to make sure that no matter where a user is coming from, the site is legible and usable. Other things can be, you know, 
in accessible form. So not labeling your forms properly, multimedia accessibility also. So uh, you know, videos without captions or audio descriptions, typography, small text, um, all that kind of stuff. And then inaccessible PDFs or documents, which is kind of similar to alt text. So making sure that a screen reader understands and knows what that PDF is that somebody can download. So these are a lot of things that if your site wasn't originally built with that accessibility in mind, will take some time to fix. So now that we know some of the common accessibility struggles, let's discuss two of the common ones a little further. And up first, we're gonna talk about alt text. So there's a lot that can go into alt text, but for now, we're gonna kind of just do a high level overview. To refresh you, alt text is uh, used to help people with the screen readers know what an image is conveying. Um, also, side note, there can be some SEO bonuses to making sure that all of your images have uh, alt text in our tag because, you know, content is king here on websites. Um, so on the left, we do have proper alt text usage and on the right is improper. The main thing to remember when it comes to alt text is not every image has to have it. Um, if an image is purely decorative or an icon, let's say, it can be left blank. For example, let's start with the top one. The top image is used on your About Us page, let's say, and you want, to, so you're going to want to be as descriptive as possible. If this is, you want to showcase your office, let's say. Um, so if we look at the alt text here, we can see on the left, it's people working in a collaborative, working and collaborating at computers on desks in our downtown Houston open floor plant office. Um, this is much more detailed than on the left where it's just vague saying people working, right? Below that are the icons. Um, like I said earlier, because these are decorative and only serve as a detail to what they link to, you want to actually skip these. Uh, that's so a screen reader, a screen reader doesn't waste time reading them and can get to the important details faster. In this case, that would be the actual links themselves. And then lastly, if you're posting like an infographic or let's say an event image that has the time and date on it, um, you want to go in and add any of that important text to the alt text itself. So the user can also know what's happening at that event. Uh, color contrast is another important thing you always want to keep in mind. Color contrast, um, having good color contrasts help people perceive what's on the page. I'm sure most of us have gone to some site and had to lean in or squint to read some text that was on an overlay or something. Um, you know, our designers work with these types of things in mind. So those things aren't going to be a worry for you. Um, if you want to see how your website is currently doing, you can just Google website color contrast checker. There's a bunch out there and you can uh, usually just put in your URL and see if your site will pass these tests or not. Accessibility is a growing area in the web space and is something you know we keep in mind with testing on our sites. And if at any point you're going, this same idea applies if you're going through a rebrand or maybe a logo refresh yep. for your organization as well, because eventually the colors that you pick are going to come to this scenario for your website. So even a few steps back from redesigning your website, it's important to take a look at contrast and make sure that the colors you pick is part of that uh, branding effort or logo update, that they look good with each other. They pass the contrast test with each other, but also on light and dark backgrounds. Exactly. Uh, so up next is integration and automation opportunities. Uh, so we've gone through, you know, the UX, the design. Next is streamlining your uh, website structure for optimal experience with the different tools that you can use. You know, your website is, of course, a cornerstone for sharing, building your missions with your audience. Um, but it's still just a piece of your overall technology stack. Um, so by integrating key technologies like a CRM or donation software, you can automate internal or client-facing processes and multiply your impact while keeping your daily interaction with these things at a relative minimum. Um, I'm going to trip up on this word a million times, constituent, a constituent relationship uh, management system or CRM, which I will be calling from here on forward, uh, is a full funnel tool that helps you grow your organizations. You know, a CRM includes uh, different tools, technologies, processes, strategies that an organization 
can use to manage, improve, and deploy um, all of its interactions, regardless of the audience type. You know, it's a single source where organizations can store uh, constituent records and lists, and then use those records to communicate with people and drive that engagement between. It's also, um, you know, a data-driven technology that can be leveraged to send mass communications, automate reoccurring processes, and track the success of campaigns online. Uh, the most, one of the most popular ones, the most popular CRMs, I should say, um, is one that we work with, which is HubSpot. It's an all-in-one communication, fundraising, and customer service platform that can help you grow. It provides you with a full suite of tools that can uh, help your nonprofit increase that support. With HubSpot, you can manage your entire constituent journey from one place. It enables you to create and distribute content, manage your social media presence, uh, you know, automate your donation processes. Uh, and track your performance and make data-driven decisions. Um, and a uh, so if you're looking for something to grow your nonprofit and also make your life a lot easier, it's definitely something I would recommend looking into. Uh, you know, uh, another area HubSpot can also help you out in is that marketing automation. Like the name says, it's going to help automate those repetitive tasks like sending emails and posting on social media and even ad campaigns. Uh, it allows you to customize and personalize your experiences, which will help drive your end goal, whether that be volunteers or donating or awareness. And, you know, speaking of donating, uh, donation and fundraising platforms are super important for most nonprofits. And finding ways to integrate uh, platforms on your site that manage that for you is something we can do as we build your site out. These tools are not only um, going to allow you to collect those donations, but also allows you to create an essential database of those donors. So then you can work with that list to create further connections with them in the future and foster those strong relationships. Is there anything you want to say on any of those, Melissa? Did I cover it? Uh, no, I, I know. I think you covered it. There are varying, I'm seeing some questions and some chat comments about the varying levels of donor platforms and of CRM systems. And this is really going to be based on your needs. So uh, the number of emails that you would want to send out in an automated way, the number of segmented lists that you need. And then from a fundraising perspective, it would be the like the diversity of the funds that you're raising. So do you have recurring funding? Do you have large donors like corporate sponsorships and individual donors? Really understanding what that user experience is like, and we could pair you with a both a CRM and or a donor management system that match your specific needs. Absolutely. Okay, so now we're at the phase three. So kind of circling back, I know I just went over a lot in phase two. Um, phase one is you know the strategy phase. Next comes your launch pad, where we take everything that we uh, thought of in the strategy and design, and then dev that all out with all those different types of details. Now your site is up and running. Uh, so the last phase of your growth-driven design is continuous improvement. So that means making sure your site is meeting all those goals that we set during that strategy phase, right? Uh, you know, we'll watch the site and collect the feedback on it uh, to further improve and enhance your site. This is an iter iterative process that goes on for both big and small updates that helps your site further its goals and objectives. Um, so, you know, now that we've kind of gone through the entirety of the growth-driven design process, um, what it is, and uh, we have a better understanding of it. I'll hand it back over to Melissa for a little bit. Uh, we'll she'll kind of go over some of our offerings with this. So. Sure. So we have aligned our offerings through TechSoup to fit with this growth-driven design methodology. So regardless of where you are in the process, whether you're you know starting uh, starting over, redesigning your site, uh, making a site for the first time, or if you're more in that continuous improvement phase, our services align with each step of that process. So we'll talk a little bit about first the growth-driven design custom web website development. So this would be putting together Together, that launch pad or phase two piece of your website. So we take you through the first phase of strategy and then all the way through 
the second phase of developing and deploying your Launchpad website. This is a great fit for nonprofits, as you guys indicated in the poll in the beginning, nonprofits that have an existing website, but potentially have outgrown their current CMS or would like to see a redesign for to improve their user experience or to be more consistent with their current visuals and brand for their organization. Um, it's also great for organizations that are looking to integrate additional systems with their website. So as John went through the user journey and we looked at you know, the social media pieces and how that connects to a CRM and how that connects to automation and maybe your fundraising platform, that's the best fit for this type of website because we're looking at how can we take it to the next step from that brochure website to something that's actually going to function and maybe take some work off your plate. So this is our process um, for working with organizations to build that Launchpad site. So the strategy piece is very similar to the pieces that we went over in the strategy phase here. Like I mentioned, we try to align closely with the methodology. We go through a discovery phase with your organization to make sure that our entire project team, your account manager, the developers, the designers, everyone on our team understands the specific nuances of your organization. So we have the nonprofit background. We understand what, how nonprofits are functioning, what the primary goals usually are, but we're really looking for specifics of your organization. So we have a questionnaire that you go through and we have, you know, productive conversations so that we can understand where you're coming from and make recommendations back to you based on how your organization functions and what your goals are for your site. We do that content audit process with you and then we help you through recommending that site structure based on what we want to build and achieve together. And we formalize your scope of work, which is a blueprint for what we're actually going to design and develop for your website. For content and design, uh, we have varying levels of content services. So some organizations are extremely nuanced and require subject matter expertise, and they provide they prefer to provide their own content surrounding their services, their offerings, their mission. Um, other organizations will work with us for a more supported content experience. It really depends on you know your comfort level with writing and creating content for your site. Uh, based on that content that we finalize in whichever format, we go ahead and do a custom design process, starting with the home page and then wor working through the rest of the page types as well. That goes into development. Then following development, you receive a staging link to preview your site. You can take a look, leave comments, make sure that everything looks as it should, looks as you expected. Following your comments, we go through a thorough quality assurance testing phase, test it on all the different browsers, all the different devices, make sure that this is going to work for all of your users pri prior to pushing it out to the public, and then it goes live and we launch the site. And following that, we get into website maintenance and support. So this is that continuous improvement phase. So this is something that can happen after you've partnered with us to build the initial site, or if you already have an existing WordPress site, we provide these services for WordPress sites through TechSoup. And you can see here, this is how you can navigate to these services on TechSoup site. If you go under services, uh, everything under website services and digital marketing services are fulfilled by TAP, but these services specifically you can find under website. And the way that our website maintenance services work is these are subscription services, uh, monthly subscription services, and they are based on a number of hours and also the complexity of the tasks. So we would want to have an initial consultation with you to understand what you're looking to do to your site on a monthly basis, the types of updates that you need to make, and we would recommend a package accordingly. Um, starting at $4.99 a month, uh, those updates are things more like content updates, add a new page, swap out some pictures. When we start looking at maybe some design updates or looking at creating templates or creating dynamic content, we start looking at additional hours or more complex tasks in those higher package options.
And these are the levels that exist. Um, again, they are sub monthly subscription services and they require a three month uh, minimum, but we can work with you to find the number of hours and the complexity of services that are gonna work best for you if you're not sure. And we also provide hosting and security for WordPress websites. So um, that is starting at $124 a month, and it includes a variety of services that may not be included in traditional hosting. So the most common question we get is, you know, people will say, oh, well, I host with GoDaddy and it's X amount per month. Our hosting services do provide a little bit more than that because they have the security piece as well. It also provides you with access to our hosting team. So I know a lot of organizations take comfort in the ability to, when their site goes down, they have they have an account manager, they have a person that they know they can call and get in touch with rather than you know GoDaddy's uh, support line. So um, some people take comfort just in that piece, but there's also benefits to having the Let's Encrypt SSL certificate, um, which is the piece on your site that if if you've ever navigated to a site and your browser has told you the site is not secure, um, that's the SSL certificate that does make a site secure. So we ensure that that is installed and working properly. We also back the site up on a daily basis. This is my favorite feature because I know that no matter what changes and updates I'm making, there is always a backup. And the worst that could happen is I could have to go to a version that is at the most 24 hours old, which is very comforting as I'm making changes to anything. Um, we work on uh, patches and updates as are related to security. So uh, if you know from working with a WordPress website, plugins and WordPress versions have very frequent updates. That is something we manage under this hosting and security package. We can manage your DNS or your domain settings as well. And then we also monitor the site for security and uptime. So we have a custom monitor in place that alerts our team if any sites are down or experiencing periods of, um, of not being connected or not loading properly. All right, we will take a look now at the questions. If anyone has any questions, please feel any additional questions than what's already there, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A and we will run through what is there now. Uh, B. Monroe asked, are there any free tools to test website accessibility? Um, the first one that comes to mind for me would be the contrast checker, which I believe is web aim, A I M. And I'll type that answer out as well. Um, but that is a free contrast checker as far as accessibility as a whole running your site, a full site scan. I imagine for an automated scan, most of those are a somewhat paid service or subscription, yeah. but there are manual ways to go about it too. But Wave does have some great options. So I would definitely check that one out first. And what was that? Uh, I can put it in the chat, actually. Oh. Yeah, more than And if WebAIM also has the those more manual options as well. So yeah. WCAG compliance is the compliance that you're measuring up against when you're checking for accessibility. So they have checklists and things like that that you could pull up and go through your site manually or have someone go through your site manually. Great. Um, Julie said, my organization manages native plants. We have plant photos on our website. Should the alt task just be the name of the plant? And what if the plant is captioned? Julie, I'm not sure about the caption piece. If you mean the plant has uh, like maybe like a little placard or a card with it in the picture, I'm assuming is what you mean. John, do you want to talk yeah. about alt text there? Sure. Yeah. So if in this case, um... A, I just want to say that sounds really cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, so if let's say this is actually regarding like this page is talking about these plants in specific, I would recommend going through and adding alt text for what the plant is. So I would say photo of, and if you just already have the name of that on the page somewhere, you can just copy paste it for each one. Um, like I said, it doesn't have to be anything extensive, but in that case, I would, I would say yes. All right. Uh, Susan said, would we have the option to maintain our own site after 
uh, TAP provides the initial redesign. So yes, um, there are options for maintenance um, to, to either do it yourself or have TAP's team participate at whatever level you're comfortable with. Um, where we end up most of the time is some sort of mix between TAP's team handling maybe more complex tasks and the organization, uh, the person who was managing the website before or whoever they choose as kind of the ambassador to manage day-to-day -day updates. But we do build all of our sites using a page builder tool called Elementor, which is meant for those who do not have any previous coding experience. And it does allow for a drag and drop experience within WordPress, um, which is a nice upgrade. I know someone mentioned earlier that sometimes WordPress is a little bit intimidating. We find that when we have Elementor on top of WordPress, that it's much less intimidating and much easier to jump in and make a change that you would want to see visually. Um, other questions, Lily said, will the security component remain after the three month minimum? So, um, I imagine that's in reference to the hosting and security package. Um, the security component in the SSL certificate piece and the security monitoring, those are valid as long as the subscription is valid. So if the subscription is canceled for hosting and security, those pieces are canceled along with it. Um, there are a few things that we do from a security standpoint as far as keeping plugins and pieces of the site, uh, WordPress versions, things like that up to date. WordPress will release versions every once in a while that do address security concerns and then plugins follow suit. So we keep those updated and that would stay the same. But um, anything that we're doing as far as SSL or security monitoring on our end would end with the end of the subscription. Um, someone else said, uh, John said, what is, uh, one of the most popular and affordable CRMs that we have integrated with websites? HubSpot is not affordable for their organization. Uh, there are a bunch, as I mentioned earlier, there are a bunch of different options, whether it be donor focused or constituent relationship managed focused. That's the question I would normally ask first is what, who is it that you want to keep track of? So going back to that target audience, if it is primarily donors that you want to keep track of, I think that there are a lot of really robust donor management tools that can do the CRM piece. Um, GiveWP is one of the more popular donor management tools that we use, but that is pretty focused on collecting the funds and processing the payments in a smooth user experience. Things like Little Green Light or we've used... We've integrated a ton of different donor management platforms, but any that are kind of third party that aren't necessarily built directly on WordPress, a lot of those have the same features as a CRM. So you can collect contacts of various types, not just donors. You can also take notes and track interactions with those contacts and send them marketing messages. So there are some donor management systems that might do that, do that for you. Um, if we're looking at something that's comparable to HubSpot, but maybe priced a little bit more affordable, something like uh, Active Campaign has fairly similar features and structures, just a little bit, um, just not as robust as HubSpot. John, any others to add to that? No, I think you've covered the main ones okay. I can think of. Great. Uh, Katina said, for new nonprofits with limited funding, are there any other plans available? Uh, Katina, we do have, uh, we we do website fixes. We do one-off projects. Um, I don't, they don't, they aren't necessarily le more affordable than the monthly packages, but there are, if you have a specific project in mind and just are hesitant for budget purposes to commit to a longer term retainer, there are more one-off projects we can do that are not, depending on how your site is currently built, that are not a fold redesign, but are also not a long-term retainer. But we'd be happy to chat with you about options. And then Brittany said, what would a timeline look like from start to finish with full website development with our team? Uh, that timeline starts at about four to six months, and it really is dependent on, I will say, the most the, the driver of that timeline is the content phase. So if your site has, you know, five to 10 pages, that process tends to be 
on the shorter side of the timeline, if your site has 500 pages, it's probably going to be a little bit on the longer side of the timeline. So um, definitely prior to starting a project, something to really think about is to wrap your head around that content audit process. We'll go through the formal process with you, but if you just start thinking about it in general, what do I want my new site to look like? How much content already exists versus how much do I need to write? How much do I need to update? And who has the availability to help me on our team. Uh, we find that the fastest projects definitely have collaborative input from the content side on multiple people from the organization. So there are a lot of factors that determine it, but I would say four to six months is where we start. Those are all the questions that I see in the Q&A. Are there any others in the chat that we wanna call out? Uh, I did see one <clears throat> from the Global Outreach Foundation, just asking for any tips or trends on what should be above the fold for donors and visitors on homepages. Um, yeah, I mean, that all depends on your goal, of course, of what your website's end goal is. If it is for to gather you know, fundraising and donations, I definitely think having a link to that is going to be your above the fold is going to be your key priority. So having that maybe in the navigation, I would choose to make a call out CTA call to action color that's just for your donations. So that is kind of anytime that's on your site, that is the color for the call to action for donations, um, keeping those kind of that kind of information as high up as you can. Great. Uh, and I see Terry said, we use Wix with your program and we need to change to WordPress. TechSoup gives a 70% discount with Wix. Will they offer a discount with TAP? Our services through TechSoup are discounted at a nonprofit rate. Depending on the service, there are... Uh, we do our maintenance program does include Wix. So we can do any of those three maintenance packages for a Wix website, but hosting and development are specific to WordPress. All right. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much everyone. And thank you, Aretha for hosting. This was excellent. Thank you guys. Take care, yeah. everyone. Thank you.